Okay. Well, welcome everybody. My name is X-Ray. This is the DEF CON 30 Alt Space VR Village for DEF CON groups. So welcome. And our speaker is Jim Shaver. He's going to be talking about AWS metadata privilege escalation. Jim is a pen tester, offensive cloud security researcher, and public speaker with 13 years of IT and security experience. So Jim, uh, go ahead and take it away. All right. I'm going to stand by the podium so I'm heard. Uh, today we're going to be talking about AWS uh, privilege, pr privilege escalation. Uh, and when I talk about privilege escalation, I'm mostly talking about the uh, API uh, and sort of the back end of AWS. I'm not specifically talking about like uh, necessarily uh, operating system privilege escalation, although operating systems will be involved. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so the, some of the things we're going to be talking about today are uh, how authentication works uh, within AWS. We're going to be talking about the Instant Metadata Service, or IMDS. Uh, I will also just call it the Metadata Service. I'm going to be talking about various uh, modes of escalation, as well as uh, several tools and resources uh, that you can use, some of which I have written and some of which other people have written. Next slide, please. All right, so this is what IMDS looks like. Uh, if you're on an EC2 virtual machine, uh, you can just curl this IP address on 69254169254. Uh, you'll notice it's kind of an unusual IP address. If you've seen or been on an, a network that doesn't have DHCP working properly, you've probably gotten a 169 address. And you can think of that IP space as uh, an IP space that is non-routable. And in order to avoid collisions with 10.0 and 1.7.2 and 192 addresses, uh, Amazon chose uh, a 169 address for these for, for this non-routable interaction with the IMDS service. Uh, just a little bit of background on what I, what the metadata service is: is it's uh, a little bit of uh, semi-dynamic data that the operating system uses for um, for its own purposes, for whatever, for whatever it needs. So uh, things that are included are, are kind of benign things like the AMI ID um, and, you know, MAC addresses, network information, even the region that the virtual machine is running in. Uh, so the US East one, for example, okay. There are also other uh, interest, more interesting things for attackers in here, things like user data, which is like the machine startup script, uh, or even uh, the machine's own identity credentials and, and role-based credentials that the machine may have been granted. Um, and so this, these credentials you can think of as, as sort of the machine account, quote unquote. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is uh, an example of like a simple, like, I guess, SSRF, uh, where you have a proxy uh, parameter that's injectable with this local uh, IP, this 169 address, and it re returns uh, a role, okay? So uh, latest metadata, this is, the, this is actually returning a, a text response. Uh, from the metadata service within the virtual machine that's running this web application, okay? And what makes this kind of like the machine account, you can think of like in in the Windows world, you, you have, um, you can give like an Active Directory machine like domain admin, for example. Nobody does it, but it's, it's something that's technically possible. It's much more common in AWS to give EC2 instances roles, uh, which means they typically have uh, permissions and policies uh, either attached or assumable or whatever uh, through those roles. Uh, so if you if you go into latest metadata IAM security credentials and then there's a whole bunch of stuff. In this case, this role name is called EC2 default SSM. Uh, if you then sort of browse to that uh, role name, what will happen is it will show you uh, a JSON response that is an access key ID, a secret access key, and then a token that is uh, changes every once in a while. This is the authentication for this role, for this machine. 
so that when the machine does certain administrative tasks, it can authenticate using these credentials. And um, they kind of work like long-lived API keys for AWS, but they're they're used via the short token circuit, uh, service um, instead of uh, uh, instead of long-lived API keys. So the way that you can tell that that is happening is the first four letters of the key ID are ASIA, whereas a long-lived keys are AKIA. Okay, so we'll see another example of that later uh, as well. Next slide, please. Okay, ways to get at IMDS. So uh, obviously, you know, you can imagine a bad guy wants to get at the IMDS service of an EC2 instance. The CC2 instance is in a VPC. Maybe it has like a public interface where there's like some sort of vulnerability or some the bad guy has somehow gotten into the virtual machine. Some of the ways that that can happen is uh, you can be on the box. So if you get a shell on the box, you can just use curl like we did in, the, in some of the previous examples. So in, in that case, you would just curl you know, this web address and then you would go from there. Uh, there's also examples of, of command injection and in SSRF where if you are able to um, you know, render to a web page or something like that, uh, the results of a command, then you then you can also display the contents of the metadata service. There are also more novel examples that are the vendors and, and service providers haven't always thought about in terms of like if some sort of SSH uh, key for bastion access or if they give you, you know, there's some sort of reverse tunnel they use for, for uh, for support or VPN uh, keys that they use to connect to a box in EC2. Um, even if they disable like SSH access to the EC2 instance, you can you may still be able to tunnel network traffic over SSH uh, via SOX um, into the EC2 instance. And you can reach a local address, even though you're routing across the internet, you can still reach that local address over a SOX connection. Uh, so in that case, you would just, you know, have a browser or whatever tool that supported SOX and you would you know, tell it what SOX proxy to use and you would just query the 169 address with curl or whatever you, you whatever tool you're using um, to access the metadata service. Next slide, please. All right, so using the creds. So we've gotten this JSON response. Basically, what we do is uh, this is an example of uh, long-lived uh, credentials. You see, like AKIA. These are obviously example credentials. Um, so uh, that's what normal like API keys that you might find on like your average developer's machine look like. And this is a, an AWS credentials file uh, that might exist on their laptop uh, or on your laptop. Um, you can also, you, so you can also just use the tools that are on the box to interact with the AWS CLI or, or pull your tools onto the box if you, if you can do that. But if you can get to this, you can just copy all of the, the data out of here, copy it to, uh, you know, a box that you're using that has all your tools on it, and then put it in your AWS credentials file and use this as a profile for authenticating. Uh, so then when you're using tools like the AWS CLI, you just say AWS profile AWS session zero, which is what we have here. And then we run whatever commands using the, the CLI that we uh, have. So in this case, we're just doing a really basic STS get caller identity, which is uh, if you're familiar with AWS is a thing that tells you like information uh, about the account that you're running in. It's a good way to, to check to make sure that the, the credentials are valid. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm not going to talk really about IAM policies because they are complicated. There's lots of ways that uh, policies can be associated with the user directly, uh, either through inline policies that are directly attached to the user, managed policies that are associated with the user, uh, inline policies that are associated with a group, managed policies that are associated with a group, attached or past roles, et cetera. There's also service control policies and permission boundaries that are more used in more advanced environments. Uh, and there are some limitations 
to uh, privilege escalation that I'm not going to get super deep into today. Uh, because it's really complicated. And even some of the tools don't even understand a lot of the nuance out, uh, that, that's out there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and that's because this is like the decision tree of how like policies and that type of thing uh, happen according to AWS. And even this doesn't include all of the nuance. So there's a, a very thorough decision tree ar ar around how AWS makes uh, decisions around whether or not you or a resource within your environment has permissions to do something. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, some ways that you can use the creds. Uh, there, you know, most of the examples we're going to be using today are uh, with the AWS CLI. Um, but there are also lots of other ways that you can do it. You can use BOTO3, which is the Python SDK um, for AWS. Uh, it's just sort of takes you the next step after the AWS CLI. Uh, allows you to chain multiple things together and write like a Python script that understands how to talk to the, to the, AWS, CL, uh, the AWS API. Uh, there's other SDKs as well that you could also use. Um, there's a pretty good tool uh, written by Rhino Security Labs called AWS Escalate that can just sort of try to brute force and figure out whether or not you have uh, a, an escalatable, you know, a path to escalation within AWS. Um, and we're going to we're going to talk through some of those paths manually here in a little bit uh, using the AWS CLI instead. Uh, there's also a really good framework called Paku, also by Rhino, Rhino Security Labs. Uh, that is, you can like it's Dockerized and all of that, and uh, it's basically a Python uh, application that uh, gives you a menu, and you can sort of step it through all of the all of the ways that you can escalate in. Um, another another enumeration. It's like a it's a Swiss Army knife uh, basically. There's a couple of uh, tools that I have written that I've thrown in here as well. Uh, one is called Red Boto. Uh, and basically, it is a tool, uh, a set of tools, uh, either do enumeration or do, a, a, you know, think interesting things with operating systems within AWS or uh, connect to SSM, or which is basically like SCCM for AWS and uh, other interesting things. Uh, there's also a, a tool called Federate Me, uh, which is. I'm not sure if AWS has actually fixed this as a thing, but basically it uses federation to um, go from credentials to an AWS console, which is the web user interface of, of AWS. And sometimes it's just easier to work in the web interface than it is to work via CLI or API or with, with various tools. So that is just easier to just pop a, open a browser. And so what, the, what Federate Me does is it basically you give it your credentials and it creates a signed uh, login federation link that will pop you into the uh, console, even as like a, EC2 instance or whatever, and you have the ability to do whatever it is that that machine would be able to do if it could log into the console. Um, there's also uh, another tool uh, called Enumerate IAM, which is a good enumeration uh, tool of different IAM permissions. Uh, IAM is the system in which you do all of your identity access management with AWS. So a lot of the tools obviously revolve around that. Also, the best resource uh, out there on the internet with uh, offensive security, red team, AWS, and other cloud information is hack Hacking the Cloud. Uh, it's maintained by uh, Nick Frischette, and it's uh, very high quality and the best resource out there for this type of information. So I, I have references throughout the rest of the presentation uh, to some, some uh, articles on that. Next slide. All right, so a couple of more easy ways to escalate that I'm not going to demonstrate because I think you can kind of imagine what they might look like. So one of the ways that you can uh, escalate is you can pillage S3 buckets uh, for other creds. You might get onto a virtual machine that has some role, role credentials. 
that may have access to some S3 buckets. If you do, if you are doing sort of a gray uh, box experiment, uh, or sorry, a gray box assessment on on the environment, and you have like a scout report, uh, or 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 something like that, uh, you can know what the what the role credentials have as permissions, uh, and what S3 buckets they may have access to. Uh, with that report, it may not be actually obvious to you, or even possible for you to know without brute forcing what permissions that role that you have access to, uh, what it can do. Um, so, uh, if it's if it's if it's more of a gray box uh, assessment, and you and you've got the capability to um, do a scout report uh, with Scout Suite or whatever they're calling it this week, then. Um, you know, this can this can be a good way to find other credentials that uh, developers or other people have left laying around or uh, that might have higher privilege than what you have. It's very common for for EC2 instances to be granted roles that are access to S3 buckets, nothing else, uh, because that's one of the ways that they get data in and out of the EC2 instance. And so it's very common for them to have that access. And then it's also common for you know, uh, them not to be locked down to specific S3 buckets and they may have access to like, you know, the Terraform uh, S3 bucket or, you know, what have you. There's lots of ways that they can get uh, permissive access to the environment's S3 buckets. Another area is uh, user data. I talked about that a little bit earlier and it's basically uh, a base 64 encoded script that the machine runs at startup. And off well sometimes it's through the those role credentials that we've been talking about they have the ability to read the user data of other EC2 instances and other virtual machines in the environment. Okay. And so sometimes people put things in the startup script assuming that they as the administrators are the only people that can read that stuff and it actually doesn't take a lot of permission to be able to read an ec2 instances uh startup script so you should really treat that stuff as you know a sensitive thing and, and use uh other other means to get secrets and, and that type of thing onto the box uh next slide please all right so we're going to use we're going to talk about our first uh iam uh policy uh, or permission that uh, allows you to escalate. So um, if you have IAM add user to group, this one's like a really basic privilege escalation. Okay, so obviously you're not administrator. But if you have the ability to add any user to any group, uh, then, you know, you could just run the AWS CLI command, you know, IAM add user to group, <laughs> username Alice, Group name administrators, and if you're able to run that command, you've just privilege escalated the user Alice to the to administrator uh, in the AWS account. Okay, so it might seem like a super obvious way to uh, to privilege escalate, but it's 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 an example of of the type of thing that I'm talking about. Next slide, please. One that's pretty straightforward. But also a little bit more nuanced is I am create access key. Uh, so in this case, you are running uh, I you know I am create access key uh, for the username admin Bob. So basically, you're saying I want to create an access key for this very privileged user that I know is privileged, and I want to have their access key basically. Okay. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Uh, pass role and run instances, okay? Pass role is more, more complicated uh, because basically um, this gets into resource-based uh, privilege escalation. So in this case, you are not doing the privilege escalation. It's in fact the uh, you are spinning up an EC2 instance or a virtual machine that is doing the actual escalation, okay? So the way that pastoral works is you are given the ability to pass a role to a resource, that being the virtual machine, 
and then you run that instance with a role that is is very permissioned, uh, very well permissioned, and then you have that resource, the virtual machine, run a user data script that executes some some AWS commands that create uh, an administrator user for you, for example. Okay. Uh, a lot of people get tripped up on this one. They think that they need to have uh, SSH access to the EC2 instance when they, once they spin it up. In fact, if you specify user data, uh, the the code executes and you don't need to be on the box in order for it to happen. You don't need to have a VPC that, um, that you can SSH into. As an example, there's, there's lots of things that make this a lot easier. Um, and so uh, there are some limitations of this one. Obviously, you need to be able to pass a role that matters uh, and exists. You need to be, be able to run uh, arbitrary instances. Uh, and there also needs to be a, an instance profile that is privileged enough that can do the thing that you want it to do uh, for you to do. Yes. So there's a lot of moving parts are in, that are involved with this one. And um, but that is that is how you do that one. Uh, next slide, please. All right, there are also many other types of privilege escalation. So um, there are other services within AWS that are, you know, very not even commonly used uh, by the majority of AWS customers. So like Glue. And data pipelines and CodeStar are all, uh, you know, sort of DevOpsy types type uh, things that are that are used by some very advanced uh, environments. They absolutely have uh, methods, if configured incorrectly, uh, that allow you to privilege escalate. Another one that I uh, didn't include in the slides because it works very similarly to the EC2 instant uh, one that we just talked about is Lambda. Uh, so Lambda is like the serverless uh, functionality within AWS. And essentially, um, if you have pass role and create function, invoke function, maybe a couple of other things, you can do the same thing with Lambda that we did with that uh, EC2 instance where you can have the serverless Lambda function do all of the um, IAM functions that create a user or make you an administrator or whatever it is that you use uh, to privilege escalate. Um, next slide, please. All right, so another uh, tool that I have not really talked about publicly, but I'm, I have released uh, about a month ago, is this thing called Red AEMM. And basically what it is, is uh, I wanted to solve the problem of how do you have a uh, a cloud section to a CTF, okay? And uh, there are cloud CTFs out there that are like flaws.cloud, and they're just sort of publicly on the internet. And the what happens with those CTFs is that you're very limited in scope in terms of what you can do, and there's a lot of risk in setting them up because you're hooking somebody up to a real AWS account that could not only get hacked, but also cost you a lot of money if it gets hacked. And so the people that have, it, it incentivizes people from, from uh, having cloud CTF type things. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to solve the problem was, how do we uh, teach people about the metadata service, but don't hook them up to a real metadata service in ED2? And so what I came up with was uh, AWS actually has a project called the uh, Amazon EC2 Mock Metadata Service. It's a fake metadata service that is a Go application and a Docker container um, that emulates a, a, a real metadata service. And it's used for um, DevOps type testing where you need to test something uh, that needs to interact with the metadata service, but isn't, uh, you know, for whatever reason you want it to talk to a fake metadata service just because it's easier for you or you don't, it doesn't need to be in AWS or whatever the reason is. And so I forked that and basically developed a, a sort of a front end that is, 
very basic SSRF and sort of, you know, it, this is an example challenge of like, hey, if you put like Oxy and then uh, the, you know, domain name, this is how this proxy works. And it's not really a proxy. It's just a thing that gets you to the metadata service as part of the challenge. Uh, so the idea here is that this tool could be used in uh, capture the flag uh, exercises uh, so that people can understand a little bit more and interact with something that acts just like a metadata service. Let's, uh, it doesn't expose your AWS account. So uh, if somebody gets access to a role within here, it doesn't actually do anything. Next slide, please. So this is uh, what it looks like when you exploit the SSRF that I've built in here. So just like uh, all, what we've been seeing all along, you know, you hit this address. This is not really a fake address. This is just part of the application. So it just looks like we're exploiting uh, an SSRF in, in AWS, but this is just a Docker container. Uh, and it returns a text response, just like uh, a real metadata service. But all of this information is totally bogus. If you pull up this AMI ID, it's, it's an AMI ID that doesn't exist within AWS. This is not the, these are not the MAC addresses of the machine that this is running on. You know, all of this information is bogus and, and you can control these through a JSON uh, configuration file. And you can also uh, control uh, through uh, environment variable, variables as well. So you can imagine hiding, you know, a flag in the user data of, of this uh, meta, this, this mock metadata service essentially on a CTF. And uh, so that can be found on my GitHub. It's called Red AEM. And uh, if you have any questions about it, feel free to hit up on LinkedIn or you know, wherever I'm on, on the internet. And uh, next slide. I think that's it for me. I'm Jim Shaver. You can hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm also I Hamburglar on GitHub. Uh, I really want to thank the volunteers for their awesome work on this conference. Uh, the setup is amazing, and you know, it's one of the best uh, speaker setups that I've had as a speaker. Uh, so it's nice to just be able to come in here and talk from my uh, from my house. So uh, thanks, everybody, and I'm happy to take any of your questions. If any. So. I've worked a, a fair bit in AWS, and what I've noticed is that routinely organizations will have people who are new to AWS or they've just graduated and they're getting out into their first job or position, and they'll just jump straight into building the things, right? And IAM is sort of this thing that they get um, as, a, as a kind of an afterthought. Um, and they don't truly master the service until years into their um, their effort. Have you seen any successful attempts at you know getting people to train in IAM first rather than jump straight into building things? Uh, so I think the if I could distill down the question for those people that are not in the room, uh, essentially, do you get people to understand IAM and do it securely. Is that fair? Uh, a fair yeah, representation yeah, of the question? To it, try to get yeah. it right the first time rather than a, a retrospective look on it. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. I think it's really complicated. And uh, like I showed you a slide that demonstrated how stupid it is. And uh, I think it's very difficult to find people who really understand how it is. I think it's the number one uh, problem that uh, AWS organizations. And uh, I think, you know, it's a, are you training people and investing in them? And are you hiring people that know what they're doing? I think there's probably uh, a lot of uh, opportunity there for uh, Amazon to make it easier. Uh, uh, absolutely, it's one of the number one one number one of the number one issues with an AWS account is how complicated I am is, and it changes too. So, sorry, I can't really answer that question better. <laughs> no, no. If you did, that'd be amazing, right? I'd take that back immediately. 
Yeah, I would I would be uh, in a venture uh, capitalist office right now if I if I had that answer to that. So, thank you for the question. Anyone else? All right. Well, I'll be hanging out for another ten or so minutes. If people have questions off air, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh,